editor of the pro-Brexit website, Brexit Central, Jonathan Isaby, and the co-founder of uh, a pro-EU group, Scientists for EU, Mike Galsworthy. Thanks very much for uh, joining us. Um, Jonathan, first of all, I mean, I just wondered what um, these 34 Tory MPs were up to because they were staring, you know, a Brexit in the face today, a, certainly a form of Brexit in the face, and they, they voted against it. Well, of course, those 34 are made up of two groups of people. One a group of Brexiteers who take the view that the deal on the table does not represent a proper Brexit. And uh, I think there's a lot of people who are sympathetic to that view who did actually end up backing the deal. And there's also a smaller group of uh, enthusiastic pro-EU Remainer Tories like Dominic Grieve who are unreconciled to the referendum result and don't want to leave the European Union. So are voting yeah. down the deal yeah. because of that reason. Yeah, no, I think a point taken. I mean, just on those, the, you know, the Brexiteer MPs who voted against it. I mean, you know, the, uh, Boris Johnson and Dominic, the, these people had decided to back it. Why do you think that these others are still not backing it? Well, it was decided uh, by a lot of people when they saw the deal back in November that, that it was a bad deal. And if you look at the Brexit Central website, we run uh, dozens, if not hundreds of articles since November explaining all kinds of reasons why it is a bad deal. None of those things have changed because even when the uh, UK Parliament, when the House of Commons voted earlier in the year uh, to say they would accept the deal if the backstop was removed, the, the so-called Brady Amendment, uh, there was a majority in Parliament for doing that. The, the government didn't even uh, demand that the EU reopen those negotiations in order to do that, to, to find a, a better deal. So the deal hasn't changed since November. Uh, people thought it was a bad deal in November, still think it's a bad deal today, although clearly some of us, and I, uh, writing an editorial in Brexit Central this morning, very, very reluctantly said, I think the deal probably does need to pass today because if it doesn't, it's unclear what the House of Commons may do next week because I'm afraid John Burko, the Speaker, has ripped up the rule book. Uh, standing orders are changing. He's allowing things to happen that have never happened before. And the Remain majority in the House of Commons appears to have taken over literally yeah. the agenda. Yeah, so that was really my point. And Mike Galsworthy, I'm just interested uh, what you think. I mean, do you think you may be closer to, you know, no Brexit now? Yeah, I mean, what is going on here? You've just got a Brexiteer here sitting here saying that for months and months and months they've been saying this is a bad deal, and yet now he's supporting the deal, as is Boris Johnson, as is Jacob Rees-Mogg, but they can't convince others. They're at sixes and sevens between them, and this is at the 11th hour. They can't get their act together. I reckon we should just scrap the whole thing, rip it up, and throw it in the bin now. I mean, there are some other people who are more reasonable than me who are saying we should have a long extension so that we can work it out and keep Parliament busy for a longer period of time. But yeah, overall, anything now that gets approved by Parliament should of course go back to the public. Myself, I'm for ripping it up, but either way, we've got a complete mess on our hands and it's because the Brexiters themselves are divided even at this stage. Yeah, but also there's the point that the Labour Party, I mean, it's not exactly clear what they want. I mean, you know, if, they, if it does go to a general election, for instance, what would Jeremy Corbyn actually campaign on? Yeah. I don't know, but looking at the situation now, I mean, you have the Conservative Party advocating Brexit. They did have the DUP on their side, and they don't now. You also had Caroline Flint of, of Labour saying that she could get 30 or 40 people on board in order to back Theresa May, but they've blown it. They've just blown it between them, and the rest of the nation were just sitting here, eating popcorn, shaking our heads in sort of disbelief, um, and they can't get their act together. So if we go to a general election now, yeah, good question. What would Labour advocate? Yeah. What would the Conservative Party advocate? It's a mess for everyone. And this is, I think, a fundamental flaw with Brexit. It was proposed to the nation without a plan uh, because it was admitted at the time by the chair of Vote Leave that you could not actually get everyone on the same page. And this is what we're seeing even at this late stage. Yeah. It is Brexit itself is collapsing under the weight of its own contradiction and its own contradictory parties within it. Yeah, Jonathan, I mean, what, what's your view now on what should happen with the leadership? I mean, because she, you know, she said she'd go if her deal was back. That's not happened. So what do you think should happen now on the issue of the leadership? 
well, I think her, her saying that she would go if the deal passed obviously set a starting gun uh, on the next leadership election. And obviously, as soon as you say you're going, whatever authority you have pretty much evaporates. And frankly, she didn't have a great deal before she made that announcement. No, but what about the and timing, though? The timing is my point. Do you think she should go now and let someone else take or, or just you're happy to let the next few weeks go by and that someone else negotiates the next stage? I think it's essential that someone else negotiates the next stage if there, well, there will be a next stage, whether we leave with a deal or without a deal. Uh, I don't think her going right now would be particularly helpful. I think what needs to happen now is that the House of Commons needs to take a long, hard look at itself and look at what they, all those MPs said after the referendum and at the last general election when they said they would respect the result of the referendum and deliver Brexit. Because at the moment, you have got literally hundreds of members of parliament who are paying lip service to that promise, who said they'd respect the result, who frankly are not respecting the result. And I think the, the British public are getting increasingly angry at what they see in the House of Commons, at MPs who've said that they would deliver the result, who are stopping it from happening. Yeah, and Mike, I'm just interested in your group, the Scientists for EU, just on that issue, what difficulties yeah. does Brexit pose for scientists and, scientists and science in general in this country? Are you worried about sort of lack of sharing of data and partnerships? I mean, what, would, what are you worried about when it comes to science oh. specifically? Right, good God, all of that. Um, since the Brexit vote, science has been hurt because immediately it kicked in uncertainty. Immediately we saw people turning down jobs at universities. Immediately there was disruptions on collaboration, the fallen pound pushed up a lot of lab costs and prices for equipment that had been ordered. More recently, the threat of no deal has been extremely disruptive because if we do come out with no deal, then that means approximately 45% of our, our funding lines under Horizon 2020 would be abruptly stopped because no deal means no deal, including no deal for science. And so that has put a big chilling effect on UK science in our relations with, with the EU already. So it's been extremely disruptive already. Right, OK. And Jonathan, I should give you a chance to answer the point. I mean, scientists clearly very worried about funding and the sharing and the partnerships that goes on, very crucial area of science. What, what is your answer to that? Well, science and higher education are fields where the UK is an absolute world leader and where the UK will always collaborate with institutions and companies and individuals all around the world and indeed across the European Union. I mean, you know, for instance, uh, in the higher education terms, the Erasmus scheme includes a number of countries which are not actually in the European Union. So there's absolutely no reason on earth why the UK could not continue to be involved in that programme outside of the European Union. The same should go for the Horizon 2020 uh, scheme as well for, for scientists. The okay. UK is a world leader and we should be proud of that. OK, Jonathan, okay. thanks so very much for joining us. In order to do that... Yeah. No, just a final word, very briefly, 10 seconds. Yeah, in order to do that, you need a deal. If you want to be part of Erasmus, you need a contract, a deal for that. If you want to be part of Horizon 2020 and the next programme after that, okay. you need a deal right. for that. Okay. And this is what's getting torn up. All right, Mike Goldsworthy, Jonathan Isby, thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks.